Okay, so but tonight's going to be a lot of fun because Kim told me it's going to be fun. Kim and Gaynor, I want you to, uh, yeah, they're just going to be outstanding. And we thank you, we love you, and we appreciate your gifting and calling. So come on up. Yeah, this is kind of funky without no hand here. I'll open the glass door. A little slow. Good. That's good. Uh -huh. I asked him uh, if I could share with a vision with you that I got during worship. Um, Diana had us singing Jump in the River, and I, heard, I, I didn't see us jumping in the river. I saw us in the river playing, splashing, just having a really good time. And those of you that are standing on the bank side, I can say to you, water's fine. Jump on in because you'll have a good time. I had a similar impression um, maybe a month ago. Um, Diana was leading worship, and I heard the the Holy Spirit say, "Follow that. Follow the living walk, the the river of living water, back up to the headwaters. If you know where the the river of life originates from, then you you'll really see what a blessing that is. But we can actually follow the the river of life back up to the headwaters. It would be awesome." Also, um, this evening, I got a, an LOL. Um, I don't know, you, you probably get them every now and then, and you'd be surprised how often the Holy Spirit's involved with it. But anyway, I got an LOL while I was sitting there praising worship, and I saw a desk, and it was a desk. You could tell it was a desk place with a lot of study. It had been done there. There were piles of of notes here and, and piles of papers here and some books here and I saw the the father come up and what I heard was that whoever was sitting at the desk was saying father I just want to know you I just want to know you and the father came up next to that person and just went like this across the desk and he took out a post-it note and he stuck it on the desk and said there you go so I just had to laugh because we're in a season where God is simplifying things so much because of the revelation that he's giving us. He's giving it, he's adding continuity to what we already know, things that we've, questions we've had, things in, that we've wrestled with for years. He's giving us one little bit of revelation and then bang, it makes perfect sense. So when I, when I saw that, I just had to share that with you. It's for somebody out there. Okay, so I entitled the message from now till kingdom come. Um, a lot of this message was going to be on the kingdom, but then I started paring it down because I always try to find the key point of what I want to leave if I only had a short amount of time. In other words, I'm going to simplify it. So I had a couple of pages and I took that much. And I'm hoping I can squeeze that much into the 40 or 45 minutes we have this evening. So it's going to be rich. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm praying. So uh, prepare yourself to be tweaked. Uh, my whole life, those people who know me, you know I like to give little zingers every now and then. And this is one of those nows. Um, I started a study. I really started a, a new journey about four years ago, but the the, the real change came about two years ago when I accidentally stumbled into a doorway, uh, actually a, a, a bunny trail that led me right into what God is doing for the church today. I mean, it's like frontline stuff, and I just like, I like it, you know. It's like one of those things, times you're reading the Bible, and you read something, all of a sudden you get that Rima moment. And I, I, I ran into this door, and I've been on that trail for two years, picking up all kinds of gems and, uh, and applying them to my life as I begin to understand them. And it's changed my life over the last two years. So I want to share just the one point this evening, but um, I'm going to let Gaynor start us. Well, actually, let me, let me read the scripture. First, 1 Corinthians 2.9. 
1 Corinthians 2.9 says, prepare yourself to be tweaked. No. <laughs> yes, prepare yourself to be tweaked because the scripture assures us that your eye hasn't seen and your ear hasn't heard or, or has entered into your heart the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I know you're all here tonight because you love him. So you haven't even begun to think about what God has in store for you soon. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. So go ahead. This evening, we want you to both hear and receive fresh re revelation that, you, that will challenge your perception and understanding of spiritual things. This is most important because we have already entered into a very spiritual time in church history. 1 Corinthians 2.12. Do we have that? Yeah, it's behind you. Oh, okay. You can read it over here. Just read that. Yeah. Now we have received the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. 1 Corinthians 14, 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you, unless I speak to you either in revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Tonight we also want you to see and understand that our Heavenly Father has given us four messengers to mentor to us, as we mature in our understanding of the kingdom living. We see them listed here in this verse. So over the last two years, Gaynor and I have been practicing each point that we're about to share with you. And it's really been a deeply impact, it's really de deeply impacted our lives. And my prayer for you, our prayer for you tonight is that it will benefit you as well in some way, or at least give you a little nudge in the right direction. One caveat, though. Some of the quotes that I will allude to this evening have come out of personal encounters that other believers have received when visiting either the Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, or Holy Spirit while they were in heaven. And that's one of the things that the church has been wrestling with God about probably for the last 16 years is that yes, God can, and not only can, he does. And today he is doing it. He's capturing people up in an encounter, an actual encounter. It's not a vision, it's not a dream. It's an actual, real life encounter that these people are having with the Heavenly Father, the, the, the Lord Jesus, or the Holy Spirit in heaven. How does he do that? He does it because he's God but he's trying to simplify a lot of things. And the only, one of the ways that he does that is he gives people a testimony which comes out of this encounter. So I'm going to challenge you with some of the encounters um, by quoting some of the things that these people have heard one of the, the deity uh, say to them. Okay, 1965, I was saved, saved in a home church, and I was filled with something. Uh, I was more of an agnostic atheist at the time. I was 15 years old and, well, I was 13 years old. And um, I was invited to a home church. I w went for one reason. My neighbors had a, a rifle and they invited me to go out shooting. It was in the back hills of Somas when there was nothing out there. It was just rabbit trails and we were going to go shooting out there. Um, so I went to go shooting and I came back a believer. Uh, but when I received Christ as my Savior, I had an encounter. Now, it wasn't an, uh, an, uh, an, out of the, an outside of my soul encounter. It was just I felt something shift in me. Now, when I got baptized in water, I didn't feel anything. When I got, uh, uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't feel anything. And yet, at that point, I got filled with something. And I'm, I've come to realize that that was... Uh, uh, an encounter that was associated with my salvation at the time. The Lord Jesus came in and lived inside of my heart. The Holy Spirit came alongside of me as my parakletos, the one called alongside of me to help. And 
I walked in that relationship for about 14, well, yeah, about 14 years. So that was my encounter with salvation. I'm going to let Gainer share her encounter. So in 1967, I was visiting my cousins in Camarillo, and they, they lived up on Granada. And um, my cousin and I were standing outside, and this nice-looking young guy comes riding up on a unicycle. And he had on a pair of cut-off shorts and Converse tennis shoes. And I said, oh, man. I said to my cousin, I'm going to marry that guy. This is the guy. Let's, <laughs> let, let's hope she got her per answer to her prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I periodically went to my cousin's house. And he would call me. We'd talk on the phone every day, hours. Now. You at home, you don't talk that much, but when he goes somewhere, we talk all the time. So um, anyway, uh, we would go there and just spend the holidays and stuff, and then um, he would come to my family home, and then because I lived in Oxnard. And so um, one evening, my family had gone out roller skating because we, dance we danced on roller skates, and um, I loved it. But I stayed home that evening so I could be with my boyfriend. And he said to me, he says, can I talk to you about something? Something's really important I need to talk to you about. Said, okay. So he said, if you were to die right now, do you know where you would go? And I looked at him and I said, um, I certainly hope I'm going to go to heaven. And he said, how about if I show you for sure where you can go? And I thought, well, gee, I was brought up in the Anglican church, the Church of England. If anybody knows how to get to England or to 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 heaven, that's the English. They know how to do everything, right? That's right. So anyway, he said, okay, well, well, let me show you. So he took me down the Romans Road. I don't know if you know about the Romans Road. It's just this pathway that you go through. And at the end, when he got there, he said, well, would you like to accept Jesus in your heart? And I said, I'd be an idiot not to. So I accepted Jesus. And then we were baptized at the same time. And he received the Holy Spirit before I did. And um, when he received the Holy Spirit, he totally changed. And I ran over to my girlfriend's house and I said, oh, man, he's gone crazy. He, next thing you know, he's going to want me to go to Africa. You know, I'm British. We don't go to Africa, right? <laughs> so, no, we haven't gone to Africa yet. So in 19, yeah, so in 19, and then in 1971, um, before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we got married and we started a family. In 1983, we joined a charismatic-like church. It was the most charismatic Baptist church. Remember, we're Baptists. You know, in the Baptist church, there's only three people going to, or uh, only six people going to heaven. And you, you're one of them, right? So um, they've, they've mellowed out. They never were that tight. I'm, but anyway, um, I was very strict at that time, and uh, so we started going to this uh, Grace Baptist Church. Pastor John, I forget what his last name was. He was from uh, Minnesota, so it was kind of a, like a Scandinavian name, but anyway, I remember Pastor John. And he was one of the most charismatic men I had ever sat under. I mean, you just wanted to listen to him because God had filled him with his spirit, although he really wouldn't acknowledge in front of the church that he was, you know, baptized in the Spirit. But you could see something. And I wasn't baptized in the Spirit. I could see something, and I wanted it. So anyway, we're going to this church, and what I didn't realize was that the Holy Spirit was setting us up for something, which he does. He loves to do that. It make, gives him a smile. You, we might, may not be smiling, at, we're smiling when we're in the middle of this whole drama that's taking place, but he's smiling. And uh, I believe he's going to teach us to smile uh, in the very near future. Psalm 2. Um, but anyway, our youngest daughter, who was seven years old at the time, she was going to become an unexpected player in an unfolding drama one Saturday morning. She was out playing. I was sitting in the living room watching TV. We were living in a mobile home park. And she knew the rules. You can play with your friends. There was over 100 units in that mobile home park. 
you do not go outside the mobile home park because there were very busy streets on uh, fronting, fronting this whole mobile home park along the side where we lived and along the front. Highway 14 was right over two blocks away. So it was a, a major intersection uh, off ramp. So the thing, it was just a busy place. So they understood that she understood the rules. So I'm watching TV and I hear a knock on the door. And I get up and answer it. It was very unusual because usually you don't get door to door people in a mobile home park. At least we didn't. And uh, the, saw there was a guy standing there I had never seen before. And he said, do you have a daughter named, a uh, small daughter named uh, Christina? And I said, yes. She said, would you come? He said, would you come with me? She just got run over by a truck. So I'm not smiling. I forgot what I was watching on TV. I said, let's go. So I, we ran down to the intersection. I didn't know where I was going. He ran outside the mobile home park. And right there on the, the, the busy street, she was laying off to the side. Um, um, there were people attending to her, and an ambulance was just pulling up. So I walked over to her, and, and she looked at me. And I'm staring and trying to cap capture what's going on. And, and uh, she said, I'm sorry, Dad. And it's like, OK. You know, it's like, are you going to be the daughter on my right hand that wants to smack you, or the daughter on my left hand which wants to embrace you and feel your, your pain? Well, I didn't do either one. I just kind of let her be attended to. And then they ended up loading her into the ambulance and taking her to the hospital. They asked me if I wanted to ride along. And I said, you know, I really need to go get her mom, because Gaynor was working at a library in town. Um, and uh, so I needed to go pick her up. And I said, what hospital are you taking to? And she, they said, Henry Mayo in Valencia. I said, I'll be there. Um, so they took off. I talked to the couple of the people that were there just to get an idea of who saw what. Uh, and I actually saw the guy who hit her in the truck. And he told me what happened. And I just, I, I said, don't worry about it. That's what I said. I was like, without even thinking about it, I mean, talk about a shot of grace right out of nowhere. I just said, don't worry about it. Because, well, for one reason, in my, my reasoning anyway, is my daughter's OK. She, I mean, she, I, full, I didn't fully understand really what was going on. But I've, in my part, I just forgave the guy and said, don't worry about it. So now the hard part. I have to go pick her up. So I'm getting a run up back up to the place where we live, and I jump in the truck. And I go, and I'm saying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I heard, I got this idea. I'm just going to leave it at that. You, you'll know if it's inspiration or not, but I'm just going to leave it at that and said, I got an idea. I said, just tell her that she's in the, had to be taken to the emergency room because she was hit by a large object. <laughs> like I said, he's smiling. And I go, okay, hey, that'll work. So I mean, I don't know how far it's going to fly, but <laughs> anyway, I go and I pick her up at the library. I said, come on, we got to go. Um, Christina was hit by a large object, and they had to take her to the emergency room. And Gainer's, okay, okay, is she okay? I said, Let, yeah, she's in the emergency room. Let's go. So we're riding, we're riding to the hospital. It's about a 15-minute drive from where we are to Henry Mayo. And I said, okay, let's pray. And she said, yes. So we're praying, and I said, let's just give it all to God. Let's just give it to him. And so it's like, yes, let's do that. So we're both praying, just handing it over to the Lord, the, the welfare of our daughter. Remember, when she was, after she was born, we dedicated her to you. She's in your hands. I mean, we went through the whole, the whole thing. So she gets out. We get to the uh, parking lot, and we get out. And I'm, I'm just shaking my head, and I'm saying, I got to tell you. Tell her, because in less than five minutes, she's going to be staring at our daughter, and she's going to know. So I need to tell her. So we get out of the car, and I said, I got to tell you that the, big, the large object that our daughter was hit with was a truck. So imagine me. My knees gave out on me, and I started to panic. And Kim said, remember, we prayed. 
all of a sudden the strength came into me and I didn't understand it at the time, I just knew I was strong. We walked in the hospital doors and the associate pastor, Don Coddington, never forget his name, such a, he reminds me of, of Dan. You come in and he has so much peace about him and he saw us, he was visiting another parishioner at the hospital and we told him that Christina had been hit and so he prayed with us before we went in. And I went into the emergency room and there's my little girl laying on this gurney with the things on her neck and you know she's completely strapped down and there's blood everywhere. I can honestly tell you from my mother's heart, I did not recognize my child because of the blood. She had it in her eyes, it was coming out of her mouth, it was everywhere. And I just, all of a sudden I said, you know what? I don't know what's going on here, but I know Jesus heals. And so I just stood by her bed and I wiped the blood out of her eyes. That's all I could do was wipe the blood out of her eyes. And I was praying and I said, Jesus, she belongs to you. And the moment I said that, the doctor came in and he said to us, Christina only has a broken nose, a broken or cracked collarbone, and a broken tooth. And, and she just got a brand new tooth. I mean, it was just brand new. And I said, blood, accident, 45 miles per hour, the guy's going, hits the kid, kid goes up, nothing else is wrong with her. And um, I thought, okay, you can fix the collarbone, you can do all that. But what do you do about the tooth? Well, there was an oral surgeon in the, way, in the emergency room, which never happens, and he comes in and he says, hmm, he's looking at it, he's poking at it, you know, like they do. He says, I have the perfect idea. I'm gonna put a cast on her tooth. So he takes this wad of stuff and it looks like a chunk of bubble gum and he sticks it on her tooth. And I'll, I have to admit, I, I, was, I was at the point where I could believe God for the collarbone because I mean, you know, I've, I've seen even in the natural that's, that's gonna heal. And we just believe it's going to be healed where she won't have a problem with it later on in life. And for the nose, a little bump, but that's fine. But I just, for some reason, I, I was stressing out over the tooth because, again, it was brand new. It was broken at the root. We saw the um, x-ray later on that was taken. And the dentist said, you know, normally when you get a fracture at this point in the root, the tooth is gone. I mean, it's moving around and stuff. He said, well, I'm going to put a cast on it. And I was like, well, how do you put a cast on a tooth? Well, he just stuck a big old wad of, of looked like bubble gum or putty or something on there, and it solidified just like a cast would, and it, she was going to leave that on there. So anyway, we're standing there wondering what's going to happen, and the, finally the doctors come back in, and they say, you know what? There's no reason for us to hold her here, but we're going to do it just in case there's a concussion. And it's like, okay, I can, one, one, one overnighter at the hospital, I can do that. I mean, that's not a problem. I was surprised. I thought she was going to be there for a while. But what I found out in the last two years about the Holy Spirit is he loves and he lives drama. <laughs> He's taught about it. He didn't use those words. You know, he likes chaos. He goes, he works in his, feels at home in chaos. But what I found from some people who've had encounters in heaven is the Holy Spirit loves drama. In fact, there are a host of people in heaven that call the Holy Spirit the drama king. Okay, so take it for what it's worth. It's, you don't have to take it as gospel, but again, I'm trying to tweak your mind a little bit. So you can, you can move out of the box a little bit. But let me give you a little idea of what the drama king did during this whole thing. So I'm talking with the people before, and this is what I found out. Christina was across this busy street with some friends. Knowing she was doing wrong, she was in this business center, running around, and they decided they were going to chase her. And they chased her, and not thinking, being six or seven years old, she ran out past the sidewalk and into the street. 
the guy who hit her was coming down this busy street. He was trying to make the signal. So he was going too fast. And Christina ran out in front of him. Now, he was driving a small compact pickup. But still, at 45 miles an hour, that's going to do some, some damage. He swerved. Okay, I'm going to say he swerved. Well, you can give credit to whoever, and I'm going to look past that. Again, I see somebody's hand on this truck, and he's going to make it interesting because he loves drama. So the guy swerved. I'm going to use my hand. Okay, the guy swerved to the left into what would normally would be oncoming traffic. Now he's in the wrong lane, heading off the road into a 15-foot culvert. No, no um, guardrail or anything. He, re he corrects for that. And now he's in the wrong lane, going fast, overcorrecting again. In the, now he's in the intersection, swerving around, trying to get back into the right lane. He finally gets across through the intersection and gets control of his vehicle. And he looks in the rearview mirror, and he sees my daughter laying in the middle of the street, unconscious. OK, that's drama. When this all happened, there was a doctor sitting at the light, waiting for the light to change. And he saw what happened. So he pulls across the street, pulls into the parking lot, parks, and gets out of his car to go over and see what's going on with my daughter. There's an off-duty nurse sitting in a different car, in a different lane, waiting for a different light to change. She comes in and pulls in when she's clear and pulls into the parking lot, gets out of the car, not knowing that there's a doctor there, and she goes over to see what is going on with my daughter. So if you don't see the drama of it, and then the orthodontist really just topped it all off, I thought the whole thing was kind of strange, and then he walks up and says, oh, um, he wiggles the tooth, and he says, oh, I, I can fix that. It's like, wow. So that's, that's kind of what the drama is all about. What I want to share with you about that testimony is, oh, by, and by the way, we were going to Grace Baptist at the time. So our pastor was there. Our associate pastor was there visiting somebody else. I mean, you just look at all of the fingerprints around that whole story, and you know why God can smile even when we're going through some hard, some hard stuff. So <laughs> that's my excellent example of grace. Grace is my point for tonight, and God really wants to simplify it because of the season that we're living in. That there, this is a fresh revelation for us, just in the story that I've shared with you. It's a fresh revelation of, for us about grace that is like manna from the Old Testament. And this is what the Father, I believe the Father wants to, you to know tonight. It's like manna. Grace adds fuel to us day by day, fuel from heaven for our daily needs. Okay? If you don't get anything else, out of this tonight, get that. God wants us to know that his grace is not only sufficient, but it's daily sufficient for our needs. The grace that I needed and I called on, of course, that's an intense need, and of course, God is there, and it, and it turned out very well for us and for my daughter. But how about the other hard times when you're having a hard time at work, you're having a hard time with your spouse, you're having a hard time with your kids, their school, not, not in school, whatever. Um, the, the Father wants you to know that he's going to give you a key that you can use. And this, I, I started using this key about four years ago. And uh, it's again, it's changed my life. It's saved, I believe it's saved my life a couple of times. Um, I won't get into that bunny trail, uh, maybe, maybe at another time. But Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, which is one of the slides that I brought, it assures us that we have access to grace. 
This is what it says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access, access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Believe me, it, glory, it brings, brings glory to God for us to receive this grace every day. It's an amazing truth that even non-believers have access to this grace and abundant life. That's the, that's the marvel of it. Even unbelievers have access to this grace, which will lead them to abundant life. Now, obviously, when they're, when they're moving that grace, God's going to lead them to Christ, Cornelius, is an excellent example. But even unbelievers have access to this abundant life through the grace that God's given. So I want to also stress with you the importance of follow through. Um, I saw this another key um, a number of years ago, and it's helped me to better understand how to ask for something and then know that I'm going to get it even though I have access, it doesn't mean that I walked away with it. Um, many times I miss, actually, the receiving of something that I asked for. Too many times. But in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For as surely I say to you, whatsoever, whoever, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says... So there's an active dynamic that happens when we say something out loud. A lot of times I found that I didn't get something. I said, wait a minute, what happened? Well, I went back to when I petitioned the Lord or whatever, and I realized I never verbalized it. Well, okay, I, I missed that one. But here it says, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Dick Mills used to have a common practice when he was ministering. I still remember... Every time I saw this brother, he was a prophet in the church, and he would, when he ministered, you always got something uh, that had substance to it. But every time I saw him, he would always say this. He said, when you hear something you want, just say out loud, I'll take that. <laughs> if you've ever heard Dick Mills even once, you've had to have heard him say that. I'll take that. What he was doing was he was prompting you to step into that key of receiving from the Lord by actually verbalizing it and declaring, I'm receiving that right now. In fact, I was, I was um, pondering this um, a few days ago, and I remember um, in the um, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. And I heard, saw it in a whole different perspective. It's like you walk around on the other side of it and take another look. Because I was thinking about this principle, this follow-through. And if we applied the principle of follow-through with that verse, ask and you shall receive, what Jesus is saying, ask and then receive. He was declaring it. He was making a declaration. So declare that out whenever you ask for something at that moment. Declare it in the, same, in the same way, I'm going to receive that. So, choose each morning to enter into the Father's grace for abundant life. John 10.10, Jesus announces his purpose in coming to the earth when he said, the thief comes only to order, in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now, I, I made the mistake one time of asking a few people if they had that life, and they both raised their hand. It's like, wait a minute. I, don't, I haven't met anybody who's had that much of an abundant life every day of their life. And that's what Jesus is saying. I've come so that you might have that and enjoy it, life abundant. So here's the Father's invitation to abundant life. And this is what he said. This came out of an encounter that of one of our brothers and sisters had while talking to the Heavenly Father. And this is, this is what he said. Quote from the Heavenly Father. As a child, I filled my son with grace. 
I'm not talking about grace for eternal life. I'm talking about grace for abundant life. Okay? My word says that if you come before my throne of grace to find grace, we will send fuel from heaven to you for the entire day. You won't think the same. Respond the same. You won't have any fear or fearful thoughts bombarding you. You won't get aggravated, frustrated. You won't get angry. If you receive a little, you're going to have an easy day. If it's a lot, then you might face some things, but it won't matter. And if you decide that you need more, then you can ask for more grace, and I will give you more. So hopefully that one bit of revelation that, uh, that, uh, that came out of an encounter connects a lot of the dots and scriptures together that are already part of your life. So let's accept the Father's invitation to us by holding out our hands right now and repeating this simple declaration. Father, I ask for and receive grace for this day. Okay, you think you can do that once every morning? It's that simple. Heaven is trying to simplify a lot of the, the things that we've been doing. We're in a whole new season. Pastor Steve's really starting to hammer on some of these things. I'm, he gives me one of those LOL moments at times when he mentions these things. And uh, so I'm really, really excited so I'm going to have Gaynor uh, do a wrap-up, and then I want to share uh, some free resources uh, that you can, you can access online. Believers are presently living in a new season with new benefits. Let's permit and even invite the four messengers that we spoke about at the beginning to reveal the many aspects of God's kingdom that is presently rising up all around us. Pray, Father, Give us an open heart to understand what your will is this present hour and remind us to ask and receive your grace every morning. And we all said, I'll, I'll take, take that. that. I'll take, yeah, I'll take that. Amen. Okay, I have some uh, resources if you go to the last slide. I've, these are some of the resources that I've um, touched on. Access and access to over the years. The first one is Heaven is Real. Um, it's a film that was put out in 2010. It's about a, a, a young man, a six-year-old child. His name was Colton Burpee. His dad was driving him somewhere, and he were T-boned by a car. Uh, he was in a, a coma for, I don't know, weeks or uh, maybe six weeks. It was a long time. And when he came out of it, he didn't think anything about, his, about it. He just he was a little kid. But then he started sharing with some people about the experience he had. And they were, it was just driving people nuts. Even in the church, his, pastor, his dad was a pastor of the church. I be, yeah, I believe so. Anyway, the one question that they had was people just couldn't get it through their head. And I believe this is one of the testimonies that God's trying to to, to, to put into our understanding so we understand. But the one question, if you watch the film, the one question that people just can't come to grips with until the very end was, the doctors were monitoring this young man's vitals the whole time he was in a coma. He never died. Now, we've had all kinds of uh, testimonies of people who died and went to, had an out-of-body experience, but this young man never died, and so people couldn't understand how he had these experiences that started coming out of his conversations after he came out of the coma. Excellent film. Um, I would highly recommend it. The book is good, too, uh, um, but the film is good. Next slide. Uh, if you want to know what's going on, I would, I would uh, encourage you to uh, subscribe to the Elijah List. There's a, a scripture in My Micah chapter 3, verse 7. God doesn't do anything but that he first lets his prophets know. And if you want some sneak previews about what God's doing, not everything is on this 
um, these emails that they'll send you, but they'll send you um, maybe six or seven emails every morning. You just weed through them, but there's some good stuff in there that's very prophetic about um, the season that we're in and where God's taking us as a church and as a, a people. Um, the next one. Also, God TV Daily. Um, I would encourage you to get away or at least give God equal time with the good news about what's happening in the world as opposed to just watching the bad news on TV every day because they know their whole business plan is to find the grossest, most fearsome, fear-mongering item and get you frozen to your TV set. And God is saying, no, I've got the good news networks out there now. And if you know anything about God TV, you know they've got a whole TV network. But they do send out um, a daily uh, email which gives you all of the neat things that are going on in the world. A lot of good news. A lot of good things going on there. Okay, next. That's it. Okay, there's another one. It's called Visions Beyond the Veil by H.A. Baker. If you go to Google and you search for Visions Beyond the Veil by H.A. Baker, you'll find it. It's a PDF, free download. And the reason I'm saying that is because back in the, probably the 30s or 20s, 30s, there was an orphanage, a children's rescue mission orphanage. It was just for kids. And the, the, the management, the leadership, the administration was praying for an outpouring of the Spirit to fall on this. It was in China um, uh, before World War II, and they were praying for an outpouring. They got it. But the strange thing is, none of the adults got it. It fell on the kids. The kids are running around doing all these, having all these encounters. It was, it's amazing. They had all these encounters with heaven, with angels. And um, the, the interesting thing is, um, in today's encounters, most people that have encounters in heaven, they're really not doing any much here on earth. The, the stories that I've read, the testimonies I've read, they're just, they're having the whole encounter in, uh, in heaven, and then they're, they bounce back. But these kids were actually in heaven, but they were also here going through the motions here on earth. And it's just, a, it's an amazing testimony. There's actually some videos on YouTube from, um, that were taken, some videos of some of the people that were actually there when the outpouring occurred. So it's just, it's fantastic. But uh, those are some resources that you can um, access on the internet, and Gainer's going to close in prayer. I'm just going to pray and declare, declare over you. Heavenly Father, I ask that you position us, that you align us each for receiving the fullness of your promises as they drop from the sky as manna over our lives. Open our eyes of our hearts to welcome new revelation to the knowledge, teaching, and prophecies that we have re already received. For it is written that hearing, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. And we believe that you really do love us too much to leave us the way we are. So we invite you to this grand opening of our lives, that we might see with our eyes, hear with our ears, understand with our hearts, that we might turn to you and receive your promises of healing, of deliverance, and of restoration. It is our deep desire that you make your path straight in our lives, our families, our cities, our state, our nation, and in our church. From this time forward till the kingdom comes, in the wonderful name of our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.